Good morning. Mrs. Peters here with chapter four of Poppy and Rye. In this chapter, we are going to return back to the setting uh, where Clover and Valerian are. And the chapter is called The Water Rises. The beavers built the dam higher. Inch by inch, the water rose. It licked the low banks, then swallowed them whole. It crept and crawled and poked into every crevice, filling them up. It trickled along animal paths and washed them away. It sank flowers and grasses and turned them into soup. It slid between bushes and trees and drowned them, root, leaf, and branch. It made islands of low hills. It flooded nests. The water was unstoppable. Though Clover and Valerian could observe the water rising with their own eyes, they found it hard to accept that their nest was doomed. After all, they had lived in one place for years. During that time, how many storms had they weathered? How many droughts? How many cold winters? To all questions, the answer was many. Why are the beavers doing this? The children asked. Be fair. Valerian said, with a catch in his throat and a harassed look on his face. We don't own the brook, do we? Don't you think beavers have as much a right to live here as we do? But their pond is getting huge, one of the children objected. It's taking over everything. Valerian sighed. Maybe I can talk to them. So it was that Valerian, feeling apprehensive, trying to keep his gray whiskers neat, crept down to the shore of the newly created pond. The old brook had been surrounded by many trees. The new pond was encircled by chewed off and jagged stumps. The old brook had been tranquil. The new pond fairly rattled with beavers hard at work. Even as Valerian stood there, he heard the sound of yet another tree crashing. He winced. Hello, he called out across the pond. Can I speak to someone? One of the beezer, beavers paused to look around. Hail, hey, timer, what's up? Um, I'm fine, thank you, Valerian returned politely. Who are you? The beaver asked. I, I live here. Do you? Well, that's cool. What's happening, pal? I'd like to speak to Mr. Cannon. Kaz? He's probably busy, but I'll go check. The beaver dove, leaving Valerian to pace nervously tail waving in agitation. Within moments, Mr. Kennedy burst up to the water's surface. Hey, pal, nice to see you again, he cried out. Don't think I got your name. Valerian. Val, right, what's up, pal? Well, sir, it's this. It's this pond you're building. Sight for sore eyes, isn't it, the beaver boomed. Well, I was just wondering how, I mean, no one owns the brook. So, of course, naturally, we're obliged to share. But we, well, we were wondering um, just how um, big you intended to make it. Big? Mr. Candid cried. Tell you something, pal. You ain't seen nothing yet. Talking world-class pond here. The cat's pajamas and meow and combo. Over the top. Major league. The whole enchilada. Hey, pal, Candid and company... Don't do small. But, Valerian said plaintively, if you make it too big, you'll drive us folks who live here away. Look here, pal, Mr. Candid said, I'm telling you, I'd be tickled pink to see you stay. You seem decent, clean, good manners, not a troublemaker, are you? No, sir, said Valerian. Great. Glad to have you around. Progress without pain. That's our slogan. But if you have to move, well, hey, no problem. Have a great trip. Bon voyage. Hasta la suite. Au revoir. Can't we compromise? Valerian pleaded so we can both stay. Pal, I've put quality time into that question. Comes to this. Beavers do what beavers do. There you are. Question in, answer out. Neat as a pin. Have a nice day. I mean, I mean that sincerely. Valerian, more discouraged than when he went, returned to the nest. What did they say? His children asked. We have to move. 
So Valerian and Clover began a frantic search for another suitable home. It was not easy. In the best of times, good nests were hard to find. Now they had waited too long. Many creatures, caught in the same predicament as they, were already gone. When the mice finally found an acceptable new home, it was on a hill, crusting the ridge overlooking the new pond, a small, damp hole with a large, cold boulder for a roof. The boulder was perched precariously atop the hill. As Valerian considered it, he worried that it wouldn't take much to set it rolling. That brought nightmarish visions of its tumbling away in the night, leaving his children exposed. I'm going to show you. Here's the picture of the rock, that big boulder, and I think they're expecting to nest in this place underneath it. Clover sighed. It'll have to do. I reckon it will, Valerian agreed, trying to hide his worries. Neither one mentioned that fit fitting 13 children into one dank, chilly nest was going to be difficult. Yet, even after they had found their new quarters, they put off moving. It was too painful. Only when water began to trickle down their long entryway and make puddles in the middle of their main room did they finally pack their belongings. These belongings, already mildewed and sodden, were easy enough to gather and haul out of the tunnel. Much harder was the removal of their children. Do we have to move? The first complained. But Ma, said another, what about my friends? The water isn't that bad, said a third. We can make rafts. We could build a houseboat, swim from room to room, be cool. And a fourth, do you really, 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 really promise we'll come back when the water goes down? Dear, dear children, Clover said, trying unsuccessfully to keep back her tears. We have to go. Of those children who still lived at home, Rye was the eldest. Like all the golden mice, he had fur of an earthy orange color, a tail that was not very long, small round ears, and youthful downy whiskers. He did have a small notch in his right ear, but that was the result of a childhood accident. Rye had never left home. He claimed he stayed behind to help his parents with the youngsters. Others suggested it was because he enjoyed being the oldest, which he became once Ragweed had left. Rye, Valerian said, take yourself and some of your siblings and go search out the rest of the family. Let them know your mother and I have moved to higher ground and tell them where. Rye's chest swelled with pride that it was he who had been called upon to inform his far-flung family about what was happening. Thistle, his by one litter younger sister, squeaked. Do we have to go to everybody? She wasn't even sure how many brothers and sisters that she had. Absolutely, Valerian insisted, all 63. Now, do hurry, Rye, Clover said. It's urgent. Hearing the distress in their parents' voices, Rye, Thistle, and a younger brother, Curly Doc, sped off to do as they were told. Later that afternoon, the family moved. When the children were all out of the nest, Clover and Valerian took one last lingering look about their home. Side by side, she short and plump and he tall and thin, they held paws. Suddenly Clover said, Valerian, what about Ragweed? What about him? Who's going to tell him where we've gone? Valerian pulled his whiskers. Clover love, I'd say that when and if Ragweed gets back, we'll see for, he'll see for himself that things have changed. That's all. What do you mean if? Clover asked. Just saying if we ever had a smart child, it's Ragweed. He'll find us when he comes looking. Clover and Valerian scampered out of the nest. Within hours, their old home was entirely underwater. And that ends that chapter. Chapter 5 will be coming later today. Have a good one.